One of the things, too, I want to get to is Ron Barron, who I'm always a big fan of. Speaking of funds and good performance. I mean, that guy's got a fantastic performance. And I don't know if you – have you ever gone to his uh, investment conference? I have not. So <laughs> this, this thing is awesome. So I, it, it's – there's a 29th annual, which they did this year. Uh, in the last two years, I think, uh, you know, because of COVID, they didn't have it. Uh, so he holds us at the Lincoln Center every year. And I went two years in a row when I was working at street.com. And anyone who owns like any fund or whatever, I believe, just a couple of shares on the fund or whatever, you, you're, you can go to this thing. And it's amazing. It's an amazing event. A uh, ton of people attend. A ton of famous people attend. Some famous investors and stuff like that. But this guy throws a show that's unbelievable. And he has live entertainment. He'll have uh, amazing, amazing guests. Uh, he has lunchtime. After lunch, he'll go over like the fund manager speak. And it's actually entertaining. And then at lunchtime, I think it's like a two-hour break or something, and you go, you can go to three or four different events, and he'll have like Broadway shows, and he'll have all these performers. And, he, at, and then they'll come back, and at the end of it, they and they give you food and everything. At the end of it, they have a surprise performer. It's always someone big, and I'm talking about and I look so Paul McCartney, Sting, John Bon Jovi, Jeez. Rod Stewart, Jerry Seinfeld, Bette Midler, uh, and they'll perform right, and it's a surprise. This year was Bruno Mars. I mean, Bruno Mars, that's easily a two million dollar expense. But the party that this guy throws is insane and people love going there. But just his outlook on investing, I love. Uh, you mentioned it. I'll let you go into it a little bit more. But but just, he, he doesn't care about what's going on in one year, two years, three years. Uh, and, and just to add to that, if you look at his performance in Tesla and how much shit yeah. he got being an early investor – it's incredible, but you know he was on 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 Squawk Box uh, you know, yesterday morning. It was really cool, and and I thought it was great when you talk about Tesla and everything else. I know you were impressed, right? Yeah, I caught the interview, and my big takeaway, and I'm not I'm not taking a shot here. He's brilliant. The I believe it was on uh, what's the early CNBC with Squawk. Becky Quick, yeah, yeah. And they were asking him good questions. They were trying to you know anytime you'd want to get a specific answer or kind of people want to know what to do right now or hey what are you thinking right now? And honestly, Frankie made me laugh out loud because. If it wasn't the very first thing, it was it was near the very beginning of the interview, and he explained how he walk he exercises in the morning for an hour and he watches their program. And he said very nonchalant, very kind. You, this proves my one of my theories in life that you can say anything with a smile. He said, "Yeah, I watch you guys every morning. It really doesn't affect or I don't do anything with the information as far as investing, but I am entertained by you, and it's great uh, while I'm exercising." And his point was, hey, you guys do a good job of showing what short-term moves in markets or stocks, what have you, earnings, major news. Every time they try to nail him down to say, hey, what do you think about timing the market? And I'm paraphrasing some of their questions. Or, hey, what do you think about inflation right now? Is that affecting any of your decisions right now? And he stuck to his guns. And it's Frank, it's easy when you're a billionaire, right? Because you're already a billionaire. But the big takeaway that I have from a, a younger and a, a lot to learn investor analyst is he said, hey, listen, I assume inflation's four to five percent every year. And I'm gonna double my money six to seven years because I'm buying better than I'm buying quality companies that have an advantage over other companies in their sectors. So think Warren Buffett's the way he says it is, I want companies with moats around them. Mm -hmm. Hard people to come in as competition and hurt your margins. Okay, that's great. Then he says, I want to invest in people. And he goes into the Elon Musk thing. And I believe, Frank, I don't know if you caught it, but I think he said that they have invested about $400 million in Tesla and their earnings are over $5 billion. Mm -hmm. Okay. That, well, that's pretty impressive, even though you're a long time in the stock. My big takeaway was try to ignore the short term, even though that's incredibly difficult. Especially Just trust the billionaires. Mm -hmm. Trust Buffett, Icon, uh, Ron Barron. Trust those guys. If you need the money in four months from right now, I'm sorry to say this as an employee of Curzio Research, then don't invest right now because mm -hmm. your risk reward is not in your favor and your emotions are going to get the best of you and you're going to go crazy. So show out the sh throw out the short term, but focus on people and focus on great quality companies. And now no better time because fundamentals actually matter. He could he said the same thing for the last 10 years, but yet this interview had more merit because now you can actually <laughs> see the results from fundamentals and stuff. Mm -hmm. He's always had the Teslas and high flyers and that kind of stuff, but he's also great... Um, I've not researched Hyatt hotels, but he made an interesting comment how he's trading at a cheaper valuation. Is it Hyatt or Hilton? I think he said Hyatt. Oh, okay. I wasn't sure. And then he said uh, Figs, uh, mm -hmm. uh, apparel mm -hmm. manufacturer. Yep. And he was just pointing to these. So if you're an investor, go look at some of those. Go try to think about, hey, what is he seeing long term? Switching billionaires real quick. 
this thing is with uh, Xerox has perplexed me for a long time. Carl Icahn owns a huge position, massive position in Xerox. And for the life of me, I have no Florida idea why, Frank, mm -hmm. other than maybe he just likes to, hey, it's going to generate $400 million in free cash flow and they're going to pay dividends. Mm -hmm. But why you have such a huge percentage of that, I'd like to know. My point is, is that keep looking, but Baron to Baron's advice on focusing on quality companies and people, uh, A, coming from him will uh, be be great for more ears other than coming from a guy like me. And B, it's great timing because, as you've said, fundamentals actually matter now. And I think that's a huge deal going forward. And people will um, – boring is going to make great returns going forward, and that's good for the individual investor in my opinion. Yeah. I mean, I thought that would happen yeah. before this year, but no. <laughs> because fundamentals really don't matter. If you see some of these stocks and, and how much they've gone up, uh, and, and again, the most risky stocks that have gone up incredibly. Yes, but fundamental stocks are going up as well. Yeah. Not as much, but yes, they're going up. But but you have to remember, Ron Barron's five-year total return, 26% annual basis, 10-year return, 20%. I mean, that, that's incredible. Uh, he said that in 2017, he was getting a lot of shit for backing uh, Elon Musk. Because I really like him. I think he works really hard. He's trying to change the world. He's trying to do things he's done never he's never done before. He's a young man, incredibly successful, and he drives himself to extremes. But, I mean, he saw that at a very young age. And he knew his personality was crazy, and then he got investigated by the SEC or whatever, and he said that was a good thing to calm him down a little. But, you know, time and time again, I've seen him go on CNBC over the years. This is 17, 18, when, you know, people are saying it was a fraud, it's garbage, you know what I'm talking about. And, and he just said, this is going to be my biggest investment ever. And it is. It, yeah. it accounts for 30% of his portfolio waiting in the Baron Fund. Uh, you know, you can say, well, it's up 80% year to date, still down 35% for the year, for the, uh, for the 12 months. Yeah. Uh, but I loved, I loved when he said, uh, you know, this is the safest car in the world. Yeah. <laughs> I actually oh, gosh. saw that. When he said he believes that, uh, yeah, it's the safest car in the world. And he said that um, someone tried to commit suicide, drove 250 feet off a cliff. And, and you know, I actually saw it because I just, you know, I looked at it and he said, oh, 70 miles per hour. And they lived. He goes, you know, well, if you're going to kill yourself, <laughs> use a Bentley to commit suicide or something. <laughs> and and you, you mentioned that. You have to hear that line. And it was funny because when – I saw the replay of it. Uh, I noticed that, you know, everyone was very really quiet, not laughing. I would have been hysterical because I just, <laughs> you know, when it, when, the fact that he said that, like, no, so nonchalant. Like, you know, if you're going to commit suicide, do it in this car. You think, <laughs> like, I would have, like, I love humor like that. I'm sorry. I do too. You I think really that's love because he's like a billionaire that. or because he's 79 or both? Because you can say I mean, that you want. He's a billionaire. <laughs> it's just, it, it doesn't even tell you how rich the guy is because I think it was 2000 and. 14 he bought a 40 acre or oh, 2016 something like that 40 acre hampton house for 130 million dollars i'm sorry that was in 2007 Gosh. i think that was the most expensive purchase for a house at the time good timing on housing <laughs> i mean it's a good i, I guess i mean what's that house going for now i mean you know no i bet that was right before the crash though oh, right short term it looked terrible i bet yeah, well into depends on what time in 2007 but yeah that thing probably went down like 30 percent right yeah. away but uh which he didn't care. But man, I, I like Baron a lot. I think uh, he, he's just you know straight shooter, really cool. And, and yeah, going to that point really quick where, where you invest in people, it, it's – for 30 years, I, I've been very fortunate, Daniel, to be around great people. Like my dad, who's a great investor, Kramer, uh, taught me everything about growth over like the five-year period I was in. You know, I even learned a little bit from, from Porter and stuff in terms of writing and marketing and stuff like that. And and. But being around great investors and learning from them and, and listening to, to you know how they became successful helped me tremendously. Being in the room, not reading their freaking books for some reason. I don't know. I just I don't get pleasure in reading their books compared to talking to them, which I've been fortunate to be in, in certain some of these circles. Uh, Rick Rule is a guy who used to say that to me all the time, and he used to say, you know, invest in people, invest in people, especially in the mining industry. And I did. I invested in people, but I could tell you, you know, a lot of times people say that's the most important thing. It's not the most important thing, and I've learned that the hard way because. Uh, the most important thing is, is understanding like the market conditions, the markets, right? And sometimes that's hard to do. And I feel like I have an edge there, uh, just, you know, doing it for such a long time in terms of, you know, when to really put your foot in the gas and when, when to, you know, hit the brakes a little bit. But you can invest in the greatest guy in the world with the greatest business model. But if that sector is going down, you're still going to get your ass handed to you. I mean, and gold, gold mining, that's a, a great example of that because they are great people that I've met personally. I invest behind. I did okay in some of these investments, some of them I didn't. But when the whole industry comes down, it doesn't matter who you invest in. It doesn't. I mean, maybe instead of something going down eighty percent, goes down six percent. Look at crypto. There's great crypto people, uh, great crypto projects. Some of those went down 80 percent, just as much as the altcoins, right? And you can say, "Well, I invested in a good person." So you have to be aware of your surroundings too, because you can invest in good people, but if you're investing in a pure growth stock, that's their business model is based purely on growth that they're going to lose money over the next five years. You better be careful investing in that company in this type of environment with interest rates higher, much, much higher, 
right? When you're going to see a slower growth environment, where you're seeing it now, earnings have come down to the point where they were expecting four, five, six percent growth at one time. This is September. They're expecting six percent growth for this quarter. Right now, the quarter and about 65, 70 percent of the companies reported. Right now, this quarter, you're going to show negative 5.3% growth. That's what we projected. Yeah. Like 70% of companies reporting. That's how different in five months. And from one month, it's more than a 2% difference, which is massive. That's how much the estimates have come down. So if you see all these guys saying, hey, we beat estimates, we beat estimates, be careful. Because those estimates have been revised pretty much by like 10% lower heading into this earnings. And it's easy to beat that number, right? But you just you have to be careful and understand the market conditions that you're in where you know, growth is great with 0% interest rates. You have a Fed that's there. They're flooding the, the, the market with, with, with money. But there's a lot of variables and you have to be willing to change. There's no one style that works. If there was one style that worked, everyone would use it. I know because I know 50 styles and I try to use different styles. You have to be willing to adapt to current market conditions. That's what made me, you know, which made me extremely wealthy. Uh, it, I don't want to say that. That sounds bad, but it has made, that's accounted for the most part of my wealth is the investment portion and being able to, to notice that where, okay, when to buy, when to sell, when to get aggressive, when to put on the brakes. And right now, is a, a, you know, listen, the market's doing great. You have to have some kind of protection. Buy puts, be smart. Okay, you, I could be wrong and maybe the market continues to go higher, but be smart because once you lose your money, it's gone. All right, and if, if it doesn't work out and you lose money in your puts, that's fine because the rest of your portfolio is going to be doing great. But you have to have some kind of insurance in your portfolio because it's very, I've never seen it in the course of history where you have a market that goes, that screams higher and earnings are plummeting, going down tremendously, that's a recipe for disaster, okay? It's always been a recipe for disaster, just a matter of the timing, so be careful. Maybe it doesn't happen for a year, maybe it happens six months, maybe it happens three months, but you need to protect yourself because that's what's going on right now. You're seeing earnings absolutely crash. 10 of the 11 sectors uh, have seen their earnings lowered just from January. Yeah. Just from January 1st till now. We're talking about you know a month ahead. 10 out of the 11 sectors, only utilities, is positive. And when I see that and earnings crashing and coming down and you're seeing bad earnings reports and markets going high and stocks going higher, be careful because we're at a super, super expensive valuation considering interest rates are not done going higher yet, at least from the Fed's point of view. So be safe.